Hey everybody, welcome to the Academy of Insurance weekly webinar after show. I'm your host, George, and joining us for today's after show is the director of the Academy of Insurance, Mr. Patrick Great, and today's instructor, Mr. Joe Gianfola. Welcome, gentlemen, and today's uh, webinar was very, very uh, full of details. Um, it was very, very great. Uh, reconciling contractual liability and the additional insured, the devil is always in the details. Joe, welcome, and another great uh, class from you. Thank you so much for all of your insight, and uh, really appreciate it. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, so, on a, on a fundamental level, you know, you had a, uh, I mean, on a, on a, on a uh, overall ar overarching level, there was a lot of details, like you know, uh, talking about different kinds of agreements, um, duty to defend versus duty to indemnify, uh, but on a basic level you know, you had said that contracts create a liability exposure for the named insured and you cited reasons why, uh, you know, what could go wrong with the construction of a contract, meaning like, you know, they could leave out details, are the limits good, everything like that, you know, is it ideal for the named insured? But in your estimation, you know, whose responsibility is it more to protect the insured and to make sure the contract's good in terms of insurance? Is it the the, the, the named insured themselves or the company that's writing the contract and asking the insured to sign the contract? Like who's, whose responsibility is it more it, to be more vigilant in that way? Yeah, that's a, that's a unexpected question. That was a tough question. That's a tough question to answer because I, I would say both are, need to be equally vigilant. I mean, from the general contractor's perspective, oh. as I said during the webinar probably a, a lot of times is that they the whole purpose of an indemnity agreement and insurance requirements is the general contractor wants to make sure that the subs policy is triggered first that that is primary they need to protect their insurance program for the many projects that they can that they'll get involved in so they want to protect their rates they want to protect their insurance make sure that there's enough available for other projects. Um, the whole purpose of risk management and managing risk is to make sure that ultimately it falls on the party that's responsible. The transfer of financial risk is accomplished in a couple of ways. And the subcon subcontractor, on the other hand, wants to make sure that they comply with those obligations. So if they say, or they think, initially, well, all I got to do is provide additional insured coverage. Let the agent, I'll let my agent uh, endorse a policy to include an additional insured obligation and go no further than that. That makes the uh, subcontractor or the name insured possibly vulnerable to a breach of contract action because suppose that additional insured obligation doesn't provide the details that the general contractor wanted and that the subcontractor signed the contract for. So, you know, you, there are many different uh, additional insured endorsements out there these days. Back in 1985, I, I think I remember these, it was called the 2010, was it 2010, 85? They were 2010, 85, yeah. Now, the one thing about, I made a verb just now, but one of the things about that is that it was so broad, you know, it says we'll cover you uh, as an insurance company, we'll cover you for all the work and any liability arising out of that work. I can guarantee that many insurance companies treated that endorsement as a throw-in for little or, or no additional premium, certainly not to measure it with the risk that they were picking up. So the insurance company has, as another party, although they're not a direct party to the contract, they have a, a serious interest in the kind of coverage that they're agreeing to provide and making sure that the premium is commensurate with that assumption uh, of risk. Uh, but since 1985, the policies have changed, a little, uh, the endorsements have changed a lot. A lot of it in response to uh, case law. So. You know, I know, Patrick, you provide um, some uh, fundamental, um, some webinars about the CGL cards. And I think one of the ones that you, well, property risk as well, but I think one of the ones you you, you did were, were, was on additional insurance endorsements. 
there's a lot they've yeah. evolved and they're precise now and oh, yeah. that's why i said at the end i think that question was good about what advice would you give and i think the only advice i can really get is be precise and make sure the kind of coverage that you're providing as an underwriter is consistent with what the insured obligated himself to in the in the uh, contract Patrick, what are your thoughts on on that? I mean, the additional insureds, it does go that the CGL masterclass do, does go hand in hand with uh, with Joe's class today. I mean, um, how would you how would you compare? And what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, and Joe brings out some great points because the additional insured endorsements today are not at all like they were when I first got into the insurance industry, even uh, in two thousand five. We were still using. Uh, an 1185 uh, edition of additional insured endorsements. And it, and, you know, Joe's right back in those days, it, it didn't have any limiting language. It simply said the, uh, the, 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 the entity, the individual or the organization listed on the endorsement is an additional insured. Well, that's great. But uh, today there's so much language written into all of those additional insured endorsements that, that limit the scope of what's covered so much that, that it, it really does fall, it, it, it really does become an important thing to make sure that anytime there's a contractual uh, transfer of risk, that the agents involved, that the uh, entities involved make sure that they understand exactly what it is that they are signing so that uh, the yeah. correct endorsements can be added to the policy or the correct limits can be created because you know you know it could be that it could be for example that, that there's a three million dollar limit required in the contract well the, the insured may only have five hundred thousand and so uh, sometimes I've seen where uh, where the the, even the inclusion of an umbrella policy or an excess policy that covers the rest of that might not even comply with those contract obligations. So it's really important, as Joe says, to follow all those details. Joe, do you, I mean, do, do you agree? Is there anything you can add to that? Do you agree with everything Patrick just said? Because it, yeah. it seems like it's fun and standard, but I was just wanted to make sure that no, uh, yeah, I do, and I think uh, as you were as you were talking, Patrick, I was thinking about how valuable a good risk manager is uh, for a company. Uh, yeah. And I know, I know, not every organization has a risk manager, and I know sometimes <clears throat> the company or the organization may depend on the agent to be the risk manager. But a good risk manager, in in uh, especially in the larger projects. Somebody who's skilled in, and, and, and insurance is just one way to finance a risk. There's other uh, finance or handle, manage a risk. Uh, there are many other ways as well, but a good risk manager is, is worth their weight in gold um, to make sure that that contractual indemnity provision is what the parties intend, to make sure that the insurance requirements are followed up. Uh, to make sure, as an example, if the contract says uh, to the risk manager's employee says you have to um, you have to provide insurance for the general contractor as an additional insured for ten years. You know what if that business what if that business concludes business up prior to that ten years? Technically, they're in breach if they don't have the kind of coverage that's applicable. So. Yeah. Good risk manager, as I said, is worth their weight in gold. And even not going out that far, and so sometimes you these uh, these contractors or what have you, they're getting these additional insured endorsements, but they're not or they're not even considering whether or not they need to have uh, completed operations additional insured status, which is a separate endorsement. I mean, it could be you could be talking about two or three additional insured endorsements that might apply to these kinds of contractual issues. And, and then, of course, you have the issue of what is the prevailing law in that area like? You know, is there some kind of, uh, is there some kind of uh, tort limitation or something that may affect the terms of this contract or the terms of the endorsement? So it really is. It, it, and the funniest thing about it is that uh, we often, sent, we often in the insurance world, 
get the people with the least experience to do anything with additional insurance. You know, the, the request for an additional insured comes in, we give it to the CSR who's been there a week and that, that goes to the company, it goes to the, the new underwriting assistant that's been there four days. And in the middle of this, we're transferring millions of dollars of risk right. and we're giving it to the person who knows nothing about insurance, just enough maybe to get licensed. Yeah, and what a shock that is. Uh, come claim time. Um, you know, the, um, I, I realized that, you know, construction losses are not just limited to construction defect claims. Um, I had the, I was going to say privilege, but I had the, I had the, <laughs> I had the opportunity to handle action over cases in New York city, uh, which is a little bit different from my specialty, but recognizing how convoluted they can be. Uh, that was very interesting. But the one thing it didn't have, it didn't have the challenge of handling a construction defect case where a defect can happen. A defect can be can occur. A defect can be overlooked. And then six years later, boom, the construction defect manifests itself in some kind of a, a, a proper damage or injury. And if you're not ready for that in terms of contractual indemnity language or the type of additional insured um, application you made and the additional insured coverage that you have if different, that can be a real eye opener. And that can lead to the type of like a breach of contract claim because the kind of coverage that they wanted was the kind of coverage you thought you were providing and you left it up to someone else other than a um, experienced risk manager or somebody in the organization that's experienced in, in handling risk and ensuring risk. Sure. Joe, absolutely. Thank you again. And Patrick, um, we've got a couple of webinars next week that are related to uh, Joe's topic today. Um, on the 22nd Tuesday, uh, Richard Faber is going to talk about evaluating risk quality. And then speaking of construction defects and the injuries that may result uh, Frank Panaccio is going to join us on June 24th for workers' compensation insurance basics. Can you give us a little bit more inkling into what we're going to uh, see or expect from these two upcoming webinars? Yeah, so Richard's session is going to take us from the underwriter's perspective and talk to us about uh, the quality of the submission that comes into the underwriter and, and dig into the mindset of how is it that an underwriter looks at a risk and says yes or no. Uh, pricing and how they price it or with whatever restrictions in the coverage. I think it's going to be a very interesting session uh, and hearing from that seat. And Frank, he's, he is coming back with his uh, workers comp basics and I'm very excited. You know, we asked him to do that class first a year ago and uh, you know, it, it, it brings us to why do we have the workers comp system we have? It tell it talks to us about, some of the uh, some of the things that that we don't always think about, you know, including the employer's liability, uh, and and he digs in a little bit in some of the issues that uh, that come around with folks that work uh, on boats. So it's it's a really uh, fascinating class, and I think it, I think the two classes that folks will really enjoy and get a lot out of. Fantastic. Uh, Patrick, thanks again for uh, for coming to the after show today. Joe, thank you again uh, so much for all of your insights and information today. We hope we see you back at the Academy uh, for another class uh, super soon. So on behalf of both of you gentlemen, uh, this is George, your host saying thanks everybody for coming to the after show. And uh, we will see you next time. Have a great day. Take care of yourselves, everybody. Thank you.